next in line who took the baton, as Jerry said, is Gary Bauer, familiar face, voice to all of you in this room. Uh, he's been a steady presence in the conservative movement over the last four decades. He served as the president of the Family Research Council from 1988 to 1999 and then decided to take the pro-family, pro-life message across the nation during his 2000 president, Republican presidential run in the primaries and debates, and many people don't know this, but Louisiana in that cycle was actually going to be the first state in the nation to be in the caucuses. In fact, we have our own Iowa in Louisiana, and so they called Iowa. That was going to be the first place in the nation in that cycle. And guess who served as Gary Bauer's campaign chairman in Louisiana? <laughs> and so I spent uh, many hours on, uh, on, a, on a bus crisscrossing Louisiana with Gary and listening to how he articulated the pro-family, pro-life message. And, and quite frankly, I mean, not, it has nothing to do with me, but the message and the organization and the pastors and the churches, the other candidates dropped out of Louisiana because Gary was going to win the first caucus in Louisiana in the 2000 election. And um, it's because the message, and he was one of the first to take it and begin to shape the presidential cycle because he was willing to stand up and speak up for the family. And of course, prior to being at the Family Research Council, he served in Ronald Reagan's administration for all eight years as Under Secretary of Education and Chief Domestic Policy Advisor. And today he serves as the president of American Values, an educational nonprofit public policy organization. He's also the chairman of the Campaign for Working Families, and he's a great ally to the Family Research Council, and uh, very grateful for Gary's friendship, for his leadership. Please help me welcome Mr. Gary Bauer. <laughs> wow. I was just getting into it, guys. No, no. Uh, that, that, thank you very much, Tony. What a fantastic night. This is, uh, I can't tell you how exciting it is for me to be part of the celebration of the 40th year of the Family Research Council. Uh, Jerry, you probably would agree with this. It's a little bit like, you know, you raise a child, you're trying to do everything you can, but then after a while, you're wondering if all the other people that that child comes into contact with Will it still stay true to the values you taught, et cetera? The Family Research Council has never wavered from what Jerry started with, what I tried to do over those 10 years, and now what Tony is doing so well uh, with the support of all you good folks. Uh, I could regale you with a bunch of, of historical little uh, tidbits. I'll, I'll just give you one. When I was in the Reagan administration, I peer, this won't surprise people that know me well. I periodically got in trouble because I would go even a little further than the president. And uh, uh, there were times when I thought, wow, maybe that was the final straw. Maybe I, he loved it, but other people didn't. Dr. Dobson saw that and he started putting me on the radio program. I became unfireable because millions of Americans were finding out about what I was doing. And so when the Reagan administration was over, uh, Jim and I were talking about next steps, and Jerry was thinking about his next step, and uh, we decided that maybe I could then come in and run this Washington office, which was then folded in formally to be part of Focus on the Family. And at that very beginning, when I had that meeting with Dr. Dobson out in Colorado Springs, uh, I presented a budget to him. He didn't like it. There wasn't enough, uh, there was just too much money was needed. Uh, we prayed about it. He prayed that if God wanted to happen, doors would open. If he didn't, God would keep the doors closed. And I remember being a little disappointed in the prayer. I wanted to pray, make us have the money to, to open up the Family Research Council. I would find out later that before the day was over, 
uh, the late Ed Prince of uh, Ed and Elsa Prince would unexpectedly stop by the office, talk to Jim. In the course of the conversation, uh, Jim, Ed asked him a couple of questions, and Jim said, well, I'm struggling. I, I want to open this Washington office. And he asked Jim how much was needed. Jim told him. And uh, before Ed walked out of that office, we had the first year's budget. I mean, that prayer was answered the same day. Now, look, I, I want to use the time I have not just to keep reflecting on the past, because I think all of that happened, all these minor miracles, because the Family Research Council was supposed to be here at a time like this, right? I, I talked a little bit this morning at breakfast about knowing what time it is is essential. A lot of people don't know what time it is. It's not the 1950s. I like Ike, won't do it. If anything has been mentioned, it's more like the 1850s. We're at the edge of a cliff. We have irreconcilable differences. You know, at the beginning of the country, there were people that knew what time it was. Thomas Paine wrote the famous pamphlet, The American Crisis, the beginning of the pamphlet. You may remember from school days. Our kids today don't know these words. Payne wrote, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and the thanks of men and women. He knew what time it was. George Washington read that and was grabbed immediately. He called his officers in. He said, take this pamphlet, bring your men together, read it all to them. And then within a couple of days, they launched the beginning of the attacks that would finalize the birth of the nation because they were not sunshine patriots. And the Family Research Council is not sunshine patriots or sunshine Christians. It keeps the faith. It's speaking the truth at this incredible time in our country. What would happen now if we didn't have sunshine patriots? I wonder if we, had, if, if we had Christians that only stood up when things were good. We'd be in deep, deep trouble, my friends. We all know what's going on now. Family Research Council, Tony, all of you, we speak the truth every chance we get. We are being buried in a blizzard of lies. It's like spitting into a hurricane. You know the lies. Most of them are aimed at our children, which Tony and FRC and Focus on the Family and Dr. Dobson has devoted his life to trying to save. Lies like there is no God, that America was never great, that our founders were evil, that our children may be trapped in the wrong bodies. It just keeps coming at us. How, how did it come to this? A nation founded on the idea that liberty comes from God, that only a virtuous people can remain free. And now we're actually having a national debate on whether it's a good idea to have men dressed as women read books to our children? My father was in the 1st Marine Corps Division in World War II. His nickname was Spike. He was well known for having an anger management problem. <laughs> if I came home from the second or third grade and told Spike, that a man dressed in a dress read me a book today in the third grade? Spike would be in jail with all those January 6 folks that are in jail right now. The left's plan is to rip us out of the rich soil of Judeo-Christian civilization, and that is what Tony and the Family Research Council fights against every day. They are trying to build a socialist, neo-Marxist, secular nation to replace what we have. 
They want to disarm us. They want to indoctrinate our children. And if we follow them, it will be national suicide. When societies go down this path of demonic paganism, it always ends with the butchering of children. And that's happening already today. Abraham Lincoln, at the age of 28, gave a speech that's not appreciated as much as many of his others. It was to a young men's educational group in Illinois. Lincoln, 28 years old. Nobody's thinking of him as president anymore. He said this, all the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined, with all the treasures of the earth in their military war chests, with a Napoleon for a commander, cannot by force take a drink from the Ohio River or leave a footprint on the Blue Ridge Mountains, even if they had a thousand years to try to do it. The greatest threat to us cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, Lincoln said, we ourselves must be its author and finisher. Of as a nation as free men, we must live through all times or die of suicide. That's what we're being asked to do. We're being asked to die from suicide by rejecting and killing everything the country was built on. That's why there's a family research council. That's why Jerry took the leap of faith. That's why Jim invested money. That's why Ed Prince came in and read, wrote that check. That's why when I left the Reagan administration and I was offered a big job in a law firm in Washington, being their token conservative Christian for a, what eventually would be a million bucks a year. I went home that night and told Carol about it. And I said, honey, I, I just don't see how I could do it. I wouldn't be happy. And Carol said, couldn't you be unhappy for a couple of years? I, no, 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 no. She hates that joke. She didn't say that. She, she said, I want you to be happy, but I, I told the joke anyway, and I am not going to have a good night tonight, guys. I just, uh, just tell you that right now. <laughs> look, <laughs> look, look, ladies and gentlemen, you know this. Tony knows this. We talk about it all the time. Whether it's said directly or not, we are being asked to kneel in front of these forces. And if you defend your children, your faith, our country, they intend to destroy us. This isn't a misunderstanding. They will isolate you and crush you and throw you in jail. And if you don't believe me, talk to Mark Meadows and pray for Mark Meadows because that's what they're trying to do to him now. Reason will not stop them. I would love to think it was about winning a debate. They're moral relatives. Words change meaning within the same paragraph. You might be able to reason with crazy Aunt Helen that's got some weird ideas and get her to finally understand. Maybe you can convince a neighbor or whatever. You're not going to stop neo-Marxist pagans by reasoning with them. The Constitution's not going to stop them. They don't care about the Constitution. They don't respect the Constitution. They don't believe there's a God that inspired the Constitution. This is hard for me to say. Some of you may theologically disagree with me. I don't believe us showing them the love of God will stop them. Now, again, I think showing an individual that's wronged us the love of God may do that. But there are certain times in history where evil men will not be stopped by love. We couldn't hug Hitler out of it. <laughs> At some point, you're left with no choice. Love requires you to fight. If we are cowards and we kneel, we will have lost the constitutional republic that so many have died to give us. We would have trashed our own inheritance. 
We would have betrayed the founding fathers and we would condemn our children and grandchildren to lesser lives. We can't do that. And look, I think what's causing some people, including even some churches to kneel, is fear. They're being cowards. Revelation 21, 18 tells who's going to be thrown into the burning lake when the end times are playing themselves out. And it lists them. And I can think of all the people I would put in the list. The first group named are cowards. If they think they're going to escape trouble by caving in, by putting out LGBTQ flags outside their church, they might buy themselves a little bit of time, but if, God forbid, we're ever gone, are they going to be in for a surprise? They won't be left alone either unless they're willing to renounce God completely. I'll wrap it up here because I feel one of those famous Bauer seminars coming on, or uh, uh, filibusters. Earlier this month, the country marked the 20th second anniversary of 9-11. It's hard to believe it's 22 years. We know what happened that day, the pain, the suffering, what happened at the Pentagon, what happened at the World Trade Center towers. I want to take you to that plane that took off from Newark on the ways of San Francisco, and it was one of the hijacked planes too. The passengers in that plane found themselves in the middle of a nightmare. They gathered at the back of the plane. A debate broke out. What are we going to do? They disagreed. They disagreed so much. You know what they did on the day that was meant to kill our democracy, our constitutional republic? They voted. Everybody in favor of fighting back, raise your hand. Everybody in favor of going back and sitting in your seats. The ones who wanted to fight back won. Then they made phone calls home. They called parents and spouses and children trying to get through one last time to say, I love you, don't forget me. One of the passengers was a guy named Todd Beamer, a devout Christian man, had attended Christian schools his whole life. He tried to call home and tragically never got through. His call was rerouted to a woman at the GTE headquarters in Chicago, the phone company that was in charge of the phones in the backs of the seats on the plane. Her name was Lisa Jefferson. Todd Beamer and Lisa Jefferson talked for 13 minutes. And in that 13 minutes, they prayed together. They said the Lord's Prayer. Lisa Jefferson said she could hear other passengers joining in. After that, the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. Then they recited the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thy rod and staff will comfort me. You will be with me. And then she noticed that Todd Beamer was saying some other things, but it didn't sound like he was saying them to her. He, she heard him say to the passengers, are you ready? Are we going to do it? And then she heard him yell, let's roll. And he led these passengers down the aisle into the teeth of men armed with box cutters. We have tape, audio tape of the battle. You could hear screaming, crashing, things being thrown, people yelling out praise of God, all sorts of things. You hear a hijacker yelling out, here they come. And then there's a struggle for the controls of the plane. And it's brought down in a field in Pennsylvania. Everybody dead. Did God not hear those prayers? Of course he did. You see, our enemies that day meant even worse things for us than what happened. The experts think that plane was on the way to the White House or the Congress or maybe a nuclear power plant. We were supposed to suffer more. More of us were supposed to die. 
they actually thought, and maybe it would have worked out that way, that the republic could have actually fallen. The prayers those passengers made, God gave them the courage to stop that plane, bought us time. I have no doubt that Todd Beamer and those passengers are with our Lord today at the throne, hearing the words we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servants. My friends, the Family Research Council, American Values, Bot Broadcasting, the American Family Association, Concerned Women for America, all of you out there, the pastors that are on fire in their pulpits, we're all fighting back. We're all doing what has to be done. That's why God worked it out so the Family Research Council under Tony's leadership would be where it is today. My friends, we need to be like the passengers on that plane because our country is being hijacked. We need to vote. We need to take a stand. We need to fight back. And if we will do those things, then I believe there's a decent chance that next year and 50 years and 100 years from now, the stars and stripes may very well fly over Washington, D.C., unless the Lord has come back before then. But however it all plays out, ladies and gentlemen, we are the ones that have to save America, and that is what Tony and all of you are committed to, and we will not surrender. God bless you all. <laughs>